We will now begin our Q&A session. Simply type your question into the chat box below the video frame to submit a question. And I want to acknowledge the other committee members who are here with us this morning to help answer questions. Um, we are joined by Phyllis Arthur, Vice President of Infectious Diseases and Emerging Science Policy at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Amanda Glassman, Executive Vice President and Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. And Alexandra Phelan, Assistant Professor at the Center for Global Health Science and Security at Georgetown University Medical Center and adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center. So to get us started, um, where should pandemic financing be targeted to have the most value? Are there particular aspects related to influenza that need to be accounted for? Where did you see gaps in pandemic financing at the country level? Who wants to take that one? As we were moving, Dana, I think I missed the beginning of your question. Can you repeat it? Sure, no problem. Where should pandemic financing be targeted to have the most value? Are there particular aspects related to influenza that need to be accounted for? And where did you see gaps in pandemic financing at the country level? I'm happy to. Shall I respond to that? Does that make so, well, thanks. Uh, this has been a, a great panel and thanks to Debbie and Peter for their leadership of our group. You know, the, the, uh, there are of course routine public health programs that spend on research and development and surveillance. And, and the case of influenza is actually, you know, more developed in some respects than, than some other kinds of pathogens that organizations like CEPI work on. But that said, it's still totally inadequate to the scale of the threat uh, and, and indeed the scale of the disease burden every year, especially as climate change changes the, the populations that are exposed to, to these diseases. And you know, the, the report goes over sort of the share of, of, of global health aid that is dedicated to preparedness. There, there are various kinds of estimates, but it's between two and 21%, depending on what you count. Um, to preparedness in general. Um, and then surveillance in particular is really very, very underfunded and very patchwork. And our, as our chair put it, it's kept together with, with uh, string and cello tape. It is literally financed by paying per diems to experts to participate in, in the network of surveillance. And of course that's been strengthened with COVID-19 as another respiratory pathogen. But there's still so much to be done to get surveillance working more intentionally at high scale. Likewise on R&D, there's of course lots of investment in high income countries, um, but less that's directed to the specific needs of low and middle income countries if there were indeed a need to, to access um, pandemic influenza vaccine uh, given a, a, a spreading a pandemic potential pathogen. And then ever warm manufacturing, of course we've had this huge vaccine scale up with COVID-19, but it's all a question of the platforms, how flexible are those platforms to, pr to produce different kinds of technologies. So just to say, I think overall financing low, um, that is the scale of the threat um, and much more to do uh, in this space. Can I add one other thing to Amanda's list of things that have not been well-funded? Um, I think it's important to note what we're learning from COVID and what we probably all knew in the back of our minds as people who think about pandemic preparedness all the time is that the ground game and the health systems were never really funded to do mass immunization like this, particularly of adults. Um, I think that Debbie mentioned this, but you know, we're used to worldwide, US everywhere, really have great systems in place to vaccinate children. And if you look at H1N1, 
where it was predominantly children, the elderly, pregnant women, um, the childhood part of vaccination in many countries went relatively more smoothly. The systems are built around that. They are not built around trying to vaccinate every person over 18. Um, and that was hard in the United States where the health system is relatively rigorous and robust. So I think one of the other places is really health systems where financing of public health has not been where it needs to be to do a massive response. Thank you both for that. Moving to the next question. Um, this comment says, thank you for these reports. There is an issue around the quote, pandemic preparedness paradox, whereby pandemic investment slash governance reduces threats, which makes it more difficult to justify further or continued investments. How do you overcome this? Chime in, whoever wants to go ahead. Yeah, I can jump in on this one, which is, um, I think that we have a very good window right now that people understand, particularly business, the losses that can be incurred if we don't prepare and get ahead for the next pandemic. And I think there is a lot of thought going into which countries have done better in terms of their domestic economies um, in term, and, how, and how they've prepared to do that better. And so there's definitely a paradox generally in public health, which is if you say something's gonna go really badly and then interventions are put in place to prevent that from happening, the people say, well, you overreacted. We saw this early on in COVID with Norway and Australia and other countries that preemptively responded, didn't get hit that badly and were said, told you, you overreacted rather than saying, well, they averted a crisis. Um, but I think right now we do have a moment of time when there is, the world is still suffering from COVID-19. We're still not through the pandemic. And so there is a chance now to have the attention of governments to say, well, let's make sure that next time this happens, we're better prepared and it's we don't suffer as much lives, but also in terms of livelihoods. I think the key is to try to get everyone to think of this as national defense. And there's a place where we never take our eye off the ball. We are always thinking about innovations that protect the nation, that protect the warfighter. Um, and, and we should think of this as something that requires the vigilance that we apply to our homeland and defense strategies. It's part of our health defense and the trillions of dollars that the economy in the U.S. and worldwide have lost from this pandemic should be the impetus for that continued investment. Thank you for that. Next question is from Erin Dotton from MDHHS, Michigan Disability BETP. Uh, do you see additional funding to ensure those marginalized in the US have representation at the table to ensure equity and equality? So Actually, yes, and I hope that's another thing that is sustained. Certainly, the administration is very committed to health equity. They have a uh, health equity officer, you know, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith uh, and her team are really making this a top priority for the administration. I'll say, in addition, the private sector is as well. Um, continued investments in how to get more balance in clinical trials, how to have more data, how to have community leaders really um, close to their communities, educating on these, these uh, issues and why they're important. I think you're going to see a, a lot of focus more on health equity. And that includes thinking about not just access financially, but access physically. Um, there were a lot of innovations in this pandemic in terms of getting uh, vaccines and therapies closer to people in underserved areas. And that's a broad term. Um, and I hope and I think we're seeing that as well applied worldwide. Hopefully that leads to better healthcare delivery in different ways as well. And um, if, if I can supplement on, on Phyllis's great comment is 
I, I think there's increasingly increasing awareness globally um, that many of the decisions we've seen through COVID-19 have been decisions of bad governance and a reflection on what good governance means for decision makers, both in preparedness and response. Um, and that includes uh, fundamentally equity and participation in those decision making processes. And, you know, interestingly, um, for example, in, in the state of Maryland uh, that, that you mentioned, um, there have been community consultations about how we, how would we do the ethical rationing of of uh, ventilators um, and and tools like that in response, and I think we might see. Well, hopefully, we may see we see more of those sorts of inclusive community based participation um, planning for um, pandemic preparedness. And maybe I could address the issue of equity as it relates to the way that we finance R and D and then uh, finance manufacture and supply to low and middle income countries, because obviously, you know, the big lesson learned from Covax is as one of the questions I think that's coming in now suggests, you know, of the six and a half billion doses that have been made available to date, only 400 million have reached low and middle income countries. And that has to do with a couple of things. First is that every government, no matter at what level of income really needs to think about preparedness as a policy and to be part of entities that are preparing to, um, you know, ob obtain medical countermeasures in case of some kind of threat like this. So, I mean, I think I think about that, especially for middle income countries or upper middle income countries where there was a sort of wait and see game. I think governments really can't afford to wait and see. So that's that's one issue. And then second, in the multilateral global uh, efforts to try and um, assure supply and, and drive the R&D investments necessary to get us to approved products, um, you know, the the imbalance of financing provided for you know, just in the US versus the rest of the world is really incredible, right? I mean, Operation Warp Speed spent 13 billion to uh, manufacture, develop and manufacture vaccines for the United States. That's about $38 per capita. Well, COVAX had 1.7 billion for the rest of the world. There's just no way to make the advanced procurement contracts that were in any way able to, to compete on the market and to, to reserve the supply that was necessary. So we just have to put a lot more money up front at the ready, sufficient to buy the supplies on behalf of low-income countries. For middle-income countries, we have to figure out what to do, but I think every government really does have to say, this is something I have to prepare for in the same way that I prepare for natural disasters. And it goes back to that first question that we were addressing, which is, you know, is this part of national security or not? And it really is, uh, as we've seen in this case. And, and, and the other, I think, key thing is that, you know, COVID had, a COVID pandemic was less probable in any given year than an influenza pandemic. So we should prepare for that. Uh, and, and I hope that these reports help with it. If I can add to that as well, I think when we think about the frameworks at the international level um, that might help address this, this is where you know, the potential um, uh, we've obviously got the, uh, the PIP framework when it comes to the equitable distribution of vaccines, but, the, you know, it is still subject to the potential risks that we've seen during COVID-19 in terms of vaccine nationalism, um, advanced purchase agreements, um, export controls. And so there's a real question, a live question, whether that's going to form part, addressing those issues will form part of any negotiations for a new international instrument like a pandemic treaty. Um, and I, I do think fundamentally equity has to be at the centre of any, any negotiations for pandemic treaties going forward. Um, and that invariably includes looking at uh, what role can international governance play in addressing uh, those, those efforts, uh, as well as uh, building up capacity and financing more broadly. Thank you for that. Um, perhaps we've touched on this a bit, but um, next question is 6.4 billion doses available, but only 400 million committed to about 25% of the population in low and middle income countries seems suboptimal. How can we better manufacture and distribute to reduce the threat for flu, parentheses, and COVID? Amanda, you want to carry forward your thought well, and then I'll follow you. Yeah. So I think, you know, part of the key is to, to do the research and development on vaccines in the in periods when we are not uh, in the midst of a global pandemic. So, you know, that's why the committee um, encourages both push and pull financing to develop 
a universal flu vaccine or something that is useful um, or, or that would make it easy to produce vaccine quickly in a number of distributed sites as quickly as possible as soon as sequencing is completed. Um, and that the scale of that at the moment is insufficient. So maybe Phyllis could remark a little bit on that sort of, we, we do have a, um, a mechanism in uh, influenza preparedness, which works much better than what we've seen for COVID. So that's good. Um, but the, the question is the scale that's available to, to move forward. I think this is, a, this is a kind of global public good. And so the other piece is, you know, is the global community prepared to really scale up financing for manufacturing in interpandemic periods that would enable quick deployment of vaccines once uh, when pandemic may hit or an outbreak may hit? And um, there, you know, there are lots of different estimates of what is the requirement to sustain that ever warm manufacturing and a lot of questions because, you know, we also know that vaccine manufacturing has scaled up uh, during COVID. And so, you know, I guess the question is, I, one, one group that had been working on it estimated, you know, $60 billion a year to keep ever more manufacturing in place. I think our committee did not include that figure in our reports, but, you know, are we prepared as a global community to really assure the level of demand uh, in the non-pandemic years necessary to sustain the level of manufacturing to be able to deploy when pandemic hits. And I, I don't see that level of political commitment yet, but we have to find some ways to make this work. And I think this report is, is starting to go in that direction. Phyllis probably will have a more articulate version of this. Not at all, Amanda, that was brilliant because I think you hit on that key issue in the second half of your comments, which is however we do this manufacturing expansion. And I think that um, governments, NGOs, industry all agree we need a, a level of sustained increased manufacturing and certainly committed to geographic diversity, partly because it allows you to get product closer to where it's going um, all at the same time. And that's certainly one of the issues we learned with COVID. But I think we have to make sure that between in that interpandemic period, this particular manufacturing capacity is working on something. Um, and and that's, that's key. It needs to be sustained. Biologics manufacturing in particular actually is a series of very important incremental improvements that allow it to be more efficient. Even if you look at what happened with the COVID vaccines over the last two years, the, the two primary manufacturers went from estimated doses of 1.5 billion or so to 3 billion to further, not just by expanding the partnering that they did with manufacturing, but by in continuously improving the manufacturing process. And that's the power of um, good, high quality biologics manufacturing is that you can get those efficiencies that give you more output. So we need to think about how we do this in a voluntary way, such that you're having geographic partnerships that are incentivized by governments, by the various world banks, um, that, so that companies all over the world are partnering to have manufacturing partners everywhere to make sure they can make those very um, easy or not easy to make those transfers and continue that working relationship on the biologics improvements between themselves as the originator company and the places that may be partners to that technology. So it's, it's not a once and done. It's a mm -hmm. continuum of improving uh, manufacturing over time. Yeah, and I, I just do want to recognize that the administration announced uh, yesterday, actually, uh, An RFI. Yeah. A, exactly a, a plan to produce approximately an additional 100 million mRNA doses a month against COVID. And importantly, they said, or other pandemic viruses. Um, so far, a lot of the it's been mainly about domestic supply, but obviously this has implications for global supply as well. And you can imagine providing such financing for distributed manufacturing all over the world too. So I thought that is a really good news um, item. And the question is, you know, how global will that be in its scope? Thanks. Thank you for those comments. Next question. My concern is that this addresses only respiratory transmitted viruses. Don't you think perhaps the infrastructure that you propose would be better in adapting an all hazards all hazard approach where pandemic diseases may be further addressed? I think Debbie should answer. <laughs> 
me too. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking the one. same thing. <laughs> I'm happy to take it. And also to flag that, Alex, I'm going to be coming to you in a moment to talk about the PIP framework and what it can and can't do. So I'll give you a couple minutes to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think already it's been a big move to move from looking at purely influenza, which has been built up in an exceptional way, to looking at respiratory pathogens as a whole, um, and to take it even further to anything that could be a pandemic. Um, we could, of course, consider, I mean, it's the same thing of having to get the sequencing and hopefully being able to build a vaccine quick, quickly enough um, if that is the ultimate solution for that pathogen. Um, I think we've been had a, other outbreaks, we constantly have outbreaks, but they haven't reached pandemic potential because of the way they spread. So I, I remember I was yes, last week at a conference in London and the room was full of 200 people um, and no masks required now in England. And I said actually that if um, it was Ebola and someone had it, it would be unlikely anyone else would be infected in the room. And that's how we can contain it quickly. Whereas with respiratory pathogens, very likely quite a few people would be infected in that room because of how it spreads. And so I think with respiratory pathogens, there is something about the transmission mechanism, which makes them more difficult to stop using, let's say, public health measures of trying to get towards elimination or eradication, which is kind of the gold standard, what we'd rather do, which is not have it circulating at all. With respiratory pathogens, because they're so difficult to stop, that leads you to thinking about actually what are the kind of more scientific exits from a pandemic, which has led us to kind of looking at this from beginning to end. So I think that's why we have this focus on respiratory pathogens versus everything as a whole because of the transmission mechanism and because of what that means in terms of your public health response. Um, I don't know if I want to talk, turn maybe to Alex, talk a bit about PIP, because I think people might be interested in knowing what is the framework, what can it do, and how it needs to be expanded, which was a core part of our discussions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework or PIP framework is a non-binding international instrument that uh, WHO member states adopted uh, back in 2011. Um, and what's really unique about the PIP framework is it's no, you know, a statement or an agreement, uh, non-binding agreement between countries and the WHO about how to prepare for and respond to pandemic influenza. And it is really limited only at this point in time to pandemic influenza uh, in humans. Um, it is coupled with a series of uh, template contracts that mean uh, pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers, so vaccine, therapeutic and diagnostic manufacturers, um, uh, commit under contracts to provide a, an amount of real time and, uh, and lump sum doses of vaccines, diagnostics or therapeutics in the case of a pandemic. And that's in exchange for access to the global influenza surveillance and response system which is um, a network that's been around since 1952 uh, of sharing influenza um, virus samples around the world and national influenza centres around the world for influenza surveillance and response. Part of that agreement also includes financing through a partnership contribution, um, about 50% of GISRIS's operating costs. So it's a really unique um, public-private structure under international law. And there have been some reviews that have been conducted over recent years to look at um, you know, how the PIP framework could work, um, how it could be expanded, and there are two real key areas um, that we discussed uh, in this committee. And the, the first is um, there's been talk about expanding it to seasonal influenza, uh, that there is a, uh, a need to, when you are sharing these virus samples, there's not necessarily an understanding of whether a sample is going to be a you know, seasonal flu or whether it's going to be a pandemic flu. So to increase that surveillance and also to increase that distribution potentially of, of seasonal influenza vaccine. The seasonal influenza burden is you know, un, under-described in many countries around the world. And so the distribution of seasonal influenza vaccines is also uh, perhaps an area that we can improve public health uh, whilst also sustaining the capacity so when we do have a pandemic, we can switch our capacities to pandemic flu uh, vaccine production. Um, the second area is genetic sequence data. Uh, COVID-19, I think, has really demonstrated the power of genetic sequence data uh, in not only um, genomic, uh, genetic epidemiology for tracing um, how virus, the virus, viruses are mutating and changing and where, um, but also for the development and testing of vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics. And we've seen some proof of concepts really come to the fore and actually uh, happen during COVID-19 that hadn't been seen before. The PIP framework mentions that you know, the topic of GSD needs to be addressed. Um, and there have been a number of studies that the WHO has done looking at what are the potential options. 
um, for including GSD in the PIP framework. But it's a challenge because sequence data is not a physical sample. Uh, and so that balance of how you get um, that commitment from vaccine manufacturers uh, and you, you build up your, your potential supply for equitable distribution based on public health need, that leverage is changing. And this is all operating within a global environment of um, updates to the Nagoya Protocol, which is about accessing genetic resources and the equitable sharing of benefits. Uh, and so there's a lot of scope here for thinking about where, um, where the PIP framework can be expanded um, and what model it might serve you know, for other pathogens that I think invariably ties into also any uh, international negotiations for treaties or amendments we see going forward. Um, I think that uh, you know, the, the report does go into some of our particular recommendations, but I think at the forefront really um, you know, the consideration of genetic sequence data uh, and, and um, how we need to think about that now uh, and how our current instruments might need to be updated to address that is really a priority. Thank you so much. Our final question for this part of this morning's session is with the ongoing revision of the IHR, where are the key opportunities for other efforts like the global health security agenda to augment the IHR and improve preparedness for future health emergencies? So, so I can respond um, uh, initially on that one. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we are hoping that there is uh, some IHR amendment. There is plenty of scope from COVID-19, but that's also in parallel to discussions about a new treaty. And so we'll see at the special session of the World Health Assembly at the end of this month um, where that goes and whether the IHR revisions will occur in, in parallel. Um, you know, I think the, the global health security agenda is an incredible example of investment around the world to build up that capacity and core capacities under the international health regulations. Um, but there's definitely been a sense uh, in, in many of the reports from the independent panel and different international bodies that um, we need some form of assessment mechanism that is updated to include, you know, matters like governance and legislation um, and more, uh, more metrics and what our, our current um, target of core capacities has been, uh, but also some form of accountability. So whether that is a binding process or a compulsory process tied under, say, a pandemic treaty or under the IHR. Uh, and there's move towards taking the lessons from, say, the human rights law regime where we have universal periodic reviews. So WHO has set up a group to start trialling and piloting um, universal reviews um, under that system. And I think that that culture of accountability and that, that norm building is really critical for governance. Uh, and so I think it, you know, it'd be interesting to see where the GHSA ends up fitting uh, amongst uh, within that. But I think there's definitely uh, quite clear arguments to be expanding where attention and focus is, particularly in governance and law. Um, others might have also stuff to add in. Any other comments? I mean, maybe just to say that the whole area around pandemic prevention and preparedness and the governance of that is evolving. Um, and uh, so the, the global health security agenda is an initiative of a coalition of the willing. And the question is, how would this evolve over time? Um, how much is governed under a new treaty or a revision to the IHR? Um, and how much of the, G the global health security agenda also becomes a financing mechanism? Because, you know, famously over the past couple of years prior to COVID, the GHSA did a great job conducting external evaluations of countries' levels of preparedness um, and also developed uh, national plans, supported countries to develop national plans, which had a whole list of items to do and investments to make, but these were not financed uh, for the most part. And so the question is, can we put some real financing behind these country plans for preparedness and surveillance. And here again, uh, the US government has been at the forefront with uh, Norway, South Africa, uh, some other uh, nations in the G20 process talking about a new financial mechanism and more financing for preparedness, particularly for country level surveillance and preparedness and quick detection of outbreaks. Um, but that has not become concrete yet. So I think what happens in the next couple of months is going to be really important for the future of this area. Thank you. And with that, uh, we will 
close this first part. So thank you to our committee members for this thorough discussion on the Global Coordination Report.